silly is that? Pulls off three-pointer. Hello, welcome back to the Hoop Junkie Podcast, the number one sports podcast in the world. According to us. I'm your host, Zach, and I'm joined again by my fresh off of vacation, missing in action for the past four days, one and only Chance Baker. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, man? How have you been? Man, I'm good, man. I'm good. How you been, brother? I'm doing all right. So... Last we spoke, we were getting ready for the All-Star break, and you had the big trip to Washington coming up. So how was all that? Dude, you know, Washington was an interesting place, to say the least. Um, (laughs) It was real cool. I mean, as far as, like, dude, like, we went to uh, Points Defiance um, and, you know, and and went through that whole trail, and uh, and it got, you know, some some really dope uh, uh, photos and, and all that stuff. It was really cool. I want to go back actually, and um, and just spend a little bit more time and uh, uh, drinking some kombucha and uh, and meditating and uh, and all that, man. Because it was just, it was just, <laughs> it was real peaceful, man. I just felt really at peace with myself. I felt great. Um, I went to uh, the whole uh, Pike's place. I mean, no, excuse me, Pike yep. place, not Pike's place. Pike place. Yeah, Pike, Pike place, place market. Yep. Yeah, they. Uh, did, did you got by where they're like throwing the fish across the market yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah, bought a fish and then uh yeah, it was, it was cool. and it was probably some of the best fish I've 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 had, man. Bought the smoked salmon. It was chef's kiss. It was so good. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. Well, so while you're out there, were you able to keep up with all the fun all-star festivities? Because I know we haven't got to get to that. Man, well, you know, with that exhilarating finale on Sunday night of the All Star game, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm just gonna lead off and just be completely honest. I watched the first quarter of the All Star game, and then we turned it off, and I just started watching Netflix because I was just like, like I was with my wife, and she was like, "Why do people watch this?" She was like, "It just doesn't seem like anybody's trying. Like it just seems like." a pickup game. And I was like, yeah, it's pretty much what it is. It's a glorified pickup game. And I was sitting there. I was like, wait, I was like, why do I watch this? And I was like, I think I'm more (laughs) like the more entertaining part for me. Isn't the game. It's more of like the players mic'd up the events leading up to it and all of that, because like the game itself, like it, the one good year was 2020. And I think part of that Mm -hmm. was, you know, that was the year Kobe Kobe. passed and they're kind of playing for him. They're playing a little harder, but besides that, like the majority of the time it is like very pointless. And I think the reason I'm always locked in is just for the entertainment of like the commentary and seeing Mm -hmm. how the players, sometimes there's like some rivalries and seeing how they interact together. But the, the actual gameplay, it's just, I feel like it's somehow getting even worse. And yeah, I, I straight up tuned out after the first quarter. I kind of like watched the highlights at the end. I saw Tatum get his 50 burger or whatever. Like that's, that's fine, you know, I guess, but yeah, I, <laughs> that was, I, I straight up tuned it out, man. I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest. That was the easiest 50 burger in all of 50 burgers, <laughs> like, you know, so uh, I want to ask you this real quick. Yeah. If you were in that all-star game, how many points could you get? <clears throat> if I was in that all-star game, if you played in that All Star game and you got twenty five minutes with how many all those would you score? with all those NBA All Stars and you gave me twenty five minutes, I'm at least getting you twenty. I'm at least getting. 20. I was going to say, I, <laughs> I'd go out there and get twenty. I think I think I could go out there and get twenty in that game, dude. That's not even not even me like setting sights too high. And then when you sit there and look at the ratings numbers of that All Star game uh, and, and All Star weekend in general. Um, I think it, the NBA clearly has an issue with with uh, with their All Star Weekend. Um, it's 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 losing some luster, and I think a big reason of that is just because the engagement from players in the All Star Game is is it's just not what it used to. Like even you know the 2020 was great. You know I mean obviously players had extra motivation um, in honor of Kobe. Mm-hmm. Um, they just add the Elon Mendel. And the Elam ending, but now it seems like some of that has just lost its stick, right? And yeah, uh, it's like if the game isn't just like really close going into the end, then even with the Elam ending, it doesn't really do much. Oh, because, oh yeah, it, you know, it with Giannis's matter. team up twelve going into the fourth quarter, like it didn't really matter. They already like the twenty twenty game was close, and so they had more of a reason to that. Plus, you know, the Kobe and the mental aspect of it. But mm-hmm. yeah, if it's 
if it's like a 10 or higher game, like they're just going to chalk it up. And that's kind of what we've seen the majority of years, even with the Eli Mending, it was the same way. Well, and the league, and I was listening to Zach Lowe's podcast and league, and he was like, man, he was like, yeah, a lot of this is on the players. Cause like you saw, like Luca and Jod didn't clearly didn't care. Um, <laughs> oh yeah. Throughout. Neither of them have cared. They've both been in multiple all-stars and like, and they're the new young guys and like, two of the most exciting players to watch. If you just put it in on league pass on a Wednesday night and you want to see some excitement, like it's going to be Luca and Ja. And when those two guys like clearly don't care at all, then, you know, like you've got a problem. The you've, game. you've got yeah. a problem because those are the players that people want to see in the all-star game. And so when you sit there and you look at like right. uh, ESPN did a thing and they said, Hey, who do you want mic'd up uh, during the game? And then, so everybody voted and they voted for Luca and they mic'd up Luca and then my issue is is that uh, what going back to what Zach Lowe said, Zach Lowe was like the NBA has to take this stuff serious. If you're going to have a, a a game featuring all your all stars, why are you miking up a player in the in during the game while he's on the court? Like at one point they asked, yeah. they, they were sitting there asking Luca all these questions, and uh, they were like, Luca, walk us through what you're doing right now. Luca's like, Well, I'm passing the ball right here. Like. How serious, <laughs> yeah, that. how serious can you oh, yeah. be when you've got players running yeah. up and down and the court, breathing into a damn microphone, <laughs> and you want to sit here and say, this is, go- this is supposed to be the greatest pickup game on earth? It's yeah. not. He's like, it's- he's got the ball at the top. He's like, I, I think they're going to trap the pick and roll right here. Oh, yep, they're bringing on the trap. I'm going to try to make this pass. <laughs> like, yeah, that's that's not going to work. And another part, and I, speaking of podcasts, I listen to JJ Reddick's take. I'm not sure if you've tuned into his podcast. Uh-huh. and. He was making some really good points too, basically saying like, you know, with the way the all-star game is set up for one, these guys are basically like in nonstop like meetings and promotional events from Friday to Sunday, like up until the game. It's not like your typical routine of like getting warmed up an hour before the game and shooting around. Like they literally have like a post Malone concert going on right before the game (laughs) and then they reset everything. And like, it's never going to be a real game environment. And so that with the injury aspect, like it makes it really hard to actually like, Honestly, I don't know what a solution would be, not even getting into like the dunk contest and all that. And we can have thoughts on that, too, if you want. But as far as like the all star game, I don't have a solution, but it sounds like you might have something. So I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are. to How do, how do we fix this? Chance, I've got a solution. If I am Adam Silver, you know who I'm going to pick up the phone and give a call to? The MLB? <laughs> no, not the MLB. I know they have their their incentives with the with the home home field. That's the only thing I've seen which, that would somewhat which, make sense. Which honestly, that's not that bad of an idea. Make it east versus west again, and then do uh, a home home court advantage for the uh, uh, for the finals. That might not be a bad idea. But if mm-hmm. you don't want to do anything that alters like actual uh, ramifications of, of winning the title and things of that sort, you want to do something a little bit more lighter adjustments. This is who they need mm-hmm. to call. They need to call Mr. Beast. Let me tell you why they need to call Mr. (laughs) Beast Chance. So if you sit there and you think about it, Mr. Beast is the largest YouTuber on the planet, right? And you sit and you think about how the world and the, the, the game is changing, the world is changing, and you look at like what gets you the most interaction into your league. It's stuff like the content that Mr. Beast does, like the whole Squid Games thing that he did. Mm-hmm. Imagine incorporating NBA All Stars in that type of environment, um, where where you get to actually see their personalities in real time, but also in a fun, viewable thing. Now, if you sprinkle stuff like that in throughout the week, All Star Weekend, add corporate sponsors and all these different. Mr. Beast games, I think that would be more interesting. And also, we have to remember the All-Star weekend, the actual nuts and bolts of the weekend is probably more designed for children. You know what I mean? We all grew up loving All-Star weekend as kids, right? That was a that's a big thing yeah. for for the for the younger audience. All all adults care about All Star Weekend has nothing to do with what goes on in the court. It's actually which city it's in and all the parties that are going to be thrown, right? Yep. <laughs> so if you exactly. could bring in somebody that the youth love, like a Mr. Beast, to have them partner in, have them come up, and you've got Jason Tatum and Embiid and these crazy different um, environments, like that Mr. Beast does or whatever, and, and then you've got them like going out and uh, what Mr. Beast is most popular video 
um, is you know doing millions of views. Uh, the one he well the the most popular one he most recent one he did excuse me that he put out where he, you know you fix everybody's eyesight. Can you imagine NBA players being a part of that? You know, and the NBA going yeah. in and throwing money into that type of stuff too as well. I really think that Mr. Beast could say the NBA All Star Weekend. That's my rant, and I'm sticking to it, and I'm in support of it. And if it happens, remember, you heard it here first. <laughs> I got to say, that's a direction I did not expect to go on, on this yep. one. But I pulled it up. So Mr. Beast has 135 million subscribers on YouTube. So we'll definitely gain an audience. So in this situation, would there still be an all-star game, or would it just be replaced by a lot of like mini games and events and stuff like that? Man, you still do an all-star game. You still do an all star game, um, uh, just because of the historical thing of it, and you just let Mr. Beast control everything else with the weekend. Like, I mean, like, like even maybe uh, changing some stuff up on Saturday night. Um, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And and like, and you know, maybe you bring in Dude Perfect, right? Uh, like uh, to help with some of that stuff too. But I think they the NBA is at a point where they need to start relying on some of these, these bigger content creators to help them push their brand. I'm not, I'm not one of these big time content creators, but, (laughs) but so I can't give you any ideas of what I would do, but I know that those content creators will figure some stuff out. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. It's a hot take, but you would definitely get a big audience. Yeah. So listen, Enough of the All Star Weekend. We're gonna move on, move the bus right on past that. We're gonna go all the way from Utah and Chance. We got to talk about Atlanta. So yep. if if we've talked about it on the pod, Nate McMillan was in the hot seat, and none of us expected it to actually come this soon. <laughs> so uh, so I think it yep. kind of shook. Shook up everything, but uh, Nate McMillan was fired by the Atlanta Hawks earlier this week, um, and the leading candidate to replace him is Quinn Snyder. They've also, uh, I think they kicked the tires on an uh, Ime Udoka hiring as well. Um, so right mm-hmm. now, nothing's been confirmed, but it's looking like it's going to be Quinn Snyder. This now makes Atlanta, since 2016, a team that has went through four different head coaches. They've also went ahead and redone their whole front office um, uh, over this past year, um, bringing in people like what Landry Fields and some other guys. Mm-hmm. Chance, what does this say about the Atlanta Hawks in your opinion? It sounds like they're basically choosing Trey Young over McMillan is my first reaction when I heard this, just because that's kind of been like a theme throughout the season with Atlanta is that McMillan and Trey Young have kind of had their going back and forth. And the majority of the time, this is what happens, right? You choose the star player. We've seen that with so many examples with LeBron and all the different head coaches, even as far as like locally, when it was Mark Gasol versus David Fisdell, we've always seen the star player usually gets their way. And if they have a problem with the head coach, then the head coach is the one to go. That's what happened here. Um, when you look at Atlanta, they made their conference finals run a couple years ago, and since then they just haven't been able to get back to that level despite making moves for more win-now players like DeJounte Murray. So I think it shows that they're they're committing to Trey Young and they're ready to, to make a change. I think Quinn Snyder is a great choice. Um, I think he's mm-hmm. a really underrated head coach as far as what he did over there in Utah. So I like the fit. I think it um, – obviously it's not official yet, so we won't speak on it like it is, but – all talks are progressing towards a deal. So it sounds like maybe by the time we record again, that deal will be inked. But yeah, I think it's, you know, it's a move that can't be too surprising. But when you really look back, and I didn't even realize like four coaches since 2016, basically every other year they're changing coaches. And that's not a sustainable way to, to build a, a franchise for sure. So those are my initial thoughts. Um, any other reactions that came to your mind when this news broke? Yeah, the Hawks can't be – Hawks, you can't be serious, man. You you go through four coaches. I mean, even if you just look at it from a basketball operations standpoint, changing head coaches is a big deal, super big mm-hmm. deal, because because you, every time you change a head coach, you change the direction of your franchise. Um, and, and for you to do that four different times um, uh, since uh, since 16 – that just smells like you've got a lot of uh, uh, some internal problems that you've got to figure out because the the the, the truth is is dude that's expensive because all these mm-hmm. coaches you have to like if they they've still got time left on their deals you got to pay that money 
<laughs> yep. So yep. when you sit here and you sit here and talking about that you got four head coaches uh that you fired, that mean you that mean you still paying the bill on four different guys uh when when you've only when you've only got uh when you've got one coach. Um and yep. that is just no bueno in any business sense. But then we start looking at it from like on the court um and in the locker room. Uh, I get it. Nate McMillan probably wasn't gonna work there. Uh, we saw we saw the right ones on the wall. However, um, uh, you, this does to me raise a lot of eyebrows on uh, Trey Young. Like, mm-hmm. like you know, I, I you know I don't want to be on record sitting here saying Trey Young's a coach killer um, or any of that stuff. But but man, you got to think about it. If you're Quinn Snyder and you're thinking about taking that job, you've got to be taking that job with the uh, understanding with ownership, like, hey, look, I'm gonna try to make it work with this team uh, and everything. But if if those other four guys couldn't make it work with this player, then if I take this job, you guys need to be looking to move him. <laughs> because yeah. at, at at what point, you know, do you realize that you're just running, you're banging your head in the, uh, against the wall? So. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's it's a lot of stuff that, that's got to get figured out uh, with the Hawks over the next uh, uh, weeks, months, years um, with this whole situation. But uh, but I'm definitely keeping my eye on it uh, because uh, it, it, this it's crazy, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm I, I like that take. I think Quinn Snyder's definitely got that in his mind if he's going to accept this job. Like, I wonder if there's some type of agreement. Like, hey, if this doesn't work out, it's not going to be firing the coach instead of Trey Young this time. Like, if this doesn't work out again, then I think you know who the problem is. So, we'll see how that goes. Okay, Chance. So, Westbrook moved down the hall to the yep. L.A. Clippers. And he also made his debut in a game that we're going to get to later because it was probably one of the games of the year. Uh, oh, yeah. Ha- how do you feel about this overall fit for Westbrook, for the Clippers, uh, even for the Lakers? Overall, how do you feel about this? Honestly, I didn't really like it for the Clippers when it first came out. I just thought like the way that things have been lately, Westbrook is just not the type of player that you really just want to add to a contending team. I thought you know, with him getting bought out that maybe he'd go to a lesser team, like maybe back to Washington or something like that, let him get his you know triple doubles and just kind of ride off into the sunset that way. So when the Mm -hmm. rumors first came out that he was looking at contenders, and I think Clippers and the Heat were the two that you mostly heard the rumors around, I wasn't a huge fan of it. But I will say, and you know, he's only had one game so far, but he actually looked really good with them. He was making plays. He had like what fourteen assists. Um, He fouled out, and their offense basically fell apart once he fouled out in the game. And despite scoring over one hundred seventy points in the entire game, so. I don't know. I'm a little more optimistic now that I've seen, you know, I think playing with guys like Kawhi and Paul George, if they could just get a guy that can make plays. And one thing with Westbrook is he's going to give it his all every single night. So when you play for a team like the Clippers where Kawhi and Paul George are only going to play half of the games in general, you're going to need somebody that every single night is going to step on the court and bring it his all. And Westbrook does do that. So over time, I've come around a little more on it than I was before. I think it could work out. I don't think it really like moves him up a complete tier. Like, I don't think he's that much of a difference maker, but I think it could be a better fit than I originally thought. Man, I actually think that, that, that it's a, it's a, it's a perfect landing spot for him. In my opinion, um, yeah. when you sit there and you look at the play style of Paul George and Kawhi Leonard, both of those guys actually do better in off ball situations. And you go yep. in and you bring in somebody like a Westbrook that can, that can come in with pace, energy, up tempo offense and have mm-hmm. him attack, kick the ball back out to someone like PG sitting on the wings uh, uh, or playing at the uh, playing at the top of the arc. And then if things bog down, reset, give it to Kawhi and let Kawhi go to work. I yep. actually think that I actually think that that Westbrook piece coupled with the, bringing in Eric Gordon and all these other guys, um, just like we talked about with the Lakers. Um, having all these other – bringing in all these different role players to come in and, and surround your stars with it. I actually think the Clippers did an even better job than the Lakers did in the uh, when you look at the um, uh, the end result uh, here. I'm I'm in support of it. I actually think the Clippers are a legit title contender. I mean, because when you sit here and you look at Kawhi Leonard in the playoffs, nobody in the West uh, – I don't care what Josh says. Nobody in the West wants to see <laughs> Kawhi Leonard 
in the playoffs. I'm, Not the way a, he's looking right now, of, for sure. No. As a fan of the Mavericks who have seen him for two straight playoff series, I'm telling you, Kawhi is different, man. And like when Kawhi is is healthy and bought in, Kawhi Leonard is like the second coming of Michael Jordan. I mean, and it's and seriously, if you look at his statistics, his they lifestyle. they are eerily similar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so uh so man, I'm 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 actually excited for the clips, and I think that the clips got a shot. And, you know, all of it's gonna come down to hell. Um and uh and other than that, man, I mean you Westbrook has the support from Ty Lu and from PG, obviously. Um, uh, so I think he's actually – he went from being the scapegoat for all of the problems that were with the Lakers to now actually getting the respect um, uh, uh, from his peers. And so I, I think this is going to be good for, for Westbrook's family, Westbrook's mental health, and which yep. is, in turn is going to make him uh, a better player on the, on the court for the Clippers. Yeah, for sure. I can see all that. So, Chance, we talked a little bit about all these crazy games over the past, what, four or five days, whatever, this this weekend, whatever you want to call it. First game um, uh, I, want, I want to start with, I want to talk about that Grizzly Sixers game from the other day. Yeah. The Grizz were up plus 20. What was it, 27 points or what, what was it? How much were they up? Uh, we're, I think was 17 league? was the highest, but that was early, and they built it back was up the in the second half. Bit. Yeah, I believe so. And, yeah, I mean, Grizzlies just came out first half just looking rejuvenated. I think the entire team needed the yeah. all-star break, perhaps the entire league, because it's been nothing but high-quality games since we got back. But, yeah, I mean, Grizzlies mm-hmm. looked amazing. And this was – honestly, this was just such a fun game to watch when you've got guys like Jaron and Joel Embiid just going back and forth, protecting the yeah. paint. Jaron had a monster block on Embiid, I think it was in the first half. Embiid comes back in the mm-hmm. second half late in the fourth quarter and hits that monster block on Ja when he's driving in. Like it was it was just prime time performers that making was, that huge was, plays. That was block of the year. Yeah. That was I don't think people <laughs> talked enough about how impressive that was with Ja coming at you. Like it was <laughs> that was absolutely insane. And yeah, it was a very entertaining game. And then it came down to execution at the end. James Harden hit a crazy shot in the corner towards the end, and the Sixers they made shots when the Grizzlies didn't, and one of the biggest talks here locally among Grizzlies fans is Taylor Jenkins' reluctance to play Jaron at the five, particularly against mm-hmm. dominant players like Joel Embiid, because you notice in that game, Brandon Clark gets foul trouble. He doesn't play much, and the Grizzlies' best lineup throughout the season has been the Ja, Bain, Dylan Brooks, Jaron, and BC, Brandon Clark lineup, and you just don't get that because Brandon Clark or Jaron are always in foul trouble. Jenkins is always very reluctant to play guys. If they pick up early fouls, I think he could do better at, you know, letting them learn on the floor a little bit, but we didn't get that. And people are getting a little frustrated with Jenkins because he just doesn't give Jaron the opportunity to prove that he can play the five. And, you know, he's an Mm all-star all defensive team guy this year. You've got to give him that opportunity. And so I think that really hurt the Grizzlies down the stretch, not having Jaron out there to play the five and defend Embiid. But, yeah, I mean, it was a very mm-hmm. high-quality game, exciting back and forth, and a good way to kick off the, the season post-All-Star break. I mean, but, I mean, but Chance, like, can you can you really blame Jenkins? I mean, when you look at, like, Jaren, Jaren's foul rate has gotten much better. Oh, yeah. But if you look at someone who is – he's still prone to committing a lot of fouls, though. Yeah, like, he is. If you put him – if you put him – if you put him at the five, um, you're almost guaranteeing that he's going to foul out for the game. When you start thinking about uh, just being that the, the primary – is totally different being the secondary rim protector versus being the primary rim, protect, uh, rim protector. Um, mm-hmm. You got all these different guys driving in uh, the paint, and, you know, you being that guy that's in the middle, I don't necessarily know if Jaren can, can, can do that for long stretches of time without fouling. So – I'm gonna give I'm gonna give Jenkins a little bit of grace in that mm-hmm. standpoint. My biggest my biggest concern with with Jenkins is is that is that fourth quarter offense. Yeah. Um, when when the game slows down for the Grizz, you you always see that's when that's when all of their problems start coming. Like the Grizz, when you start talking about them in transition. Mm-hmm. Um, the, like there's no team better in the league than the Memphis Grizzlies in transition transition just because of all the athletes on the team. And then you got uh, uh, you got people like Desmond Bang coming back and Jaron coming back trailing for uh, trailer threes and all that type of stuff. Uh, the Grizz are just awesome in transition. But 
the one thing is that this team, I don't know if it's a um, uh, if it's a roster thing or if it's a coaching thing. Uh, at this point, it can't be a roster thing because rosters are set right now. Yep. It has to be a coaching thing. You you got to figure out how can we handle these games when it gets slow because, as you know, and um, as all basketball hoop junkies out there, how we all know in the playoffs. Transitions ain't you know, they ain't really a thing like you yep. know like the game slows down considerably because every possession matters um, and you're looking you're constantly looking to get the best shot um, and uh, fast breaks teams just don't give up many fast breaks when it gets to the playoffs and if they're going to go into the playoffs they got to figure that out um, you know obviously from a player standpoint you know you can sit here and talk about how you know uh, uh, Ja and Bane probably need to. Um, develop a little bit of a better mid-range game um, mm-hmm. to uh, to combat some of that, but but uh, but I think a lot of that has, is going to have to fall on uh, on Coach uh, Jenkins to figure that out because uh, because uh, this team is, is going to be a problem. But then you look at what happened uh, yesterday. Chance mm-hmm. your Memphis Grizzlies end up. Blowing out the Denver Nuggets, <laughs> yep. you know, uh, the number one team in the West, uh, and it's a completely different game. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing is, really to your point, when you watch that game last night, the defense led to everything. The Grizzlies were playing some of the best defense as far as being on point with rotation switches, helping the helper. Like, they were just on point, and the Nuggets, they also didn't have it. They, you know, they had some good looks that they missed on the premiere. They were missing Aaron Gordon. Um, Grizzlies are also missing Steven Adams, who I think is a very overlooked part of that half court offense because Steven Adams is really one of the best screen setters right. in the league and a great playmaker from the high post. And I think that's really gone unnoticed, like just how much he helps on the half court. Obviously, Steven Adams isn't like a high flyer that fits in with the rest of the group, but when you get in that half court situation, Steven Adams is a big part of getting people open. Him and Bain have a great two-man game, and mm-hmm. he gets people open in that way. And I think getting him back could help some of those half-court issues. Still a lot there, but when you notice last night, they're relying on their defense. They're getting stops, getting rebounds, and just pushing in transition, and they just never look back from there. So I think that's the key with the Grizzlies. If they're able to play their game, get stops on defense, which they have, last I checked, the number two rated defense, so they're getting the stops. It's just if the other team is – scoring and making buckets and they have superstars like Harden and Bede that are able to score and you're having to play that half court game, especially in the playoffs, that's when it gets a little different. But to your point, we saw what it looks like mm-hmm. when they are able to fly up and down the court and play in transition. And, you know, they, they look scary last night. So they just need to find a way to get that half court going to where when the game does slow down, particularly in the playoffs, they don't just look shell shock. Like they're not just doing the job one four ISO and see what happens. And, you know, when you're going against guys like Embiid, you saw what happens when he tries to take him one on one. Like it doesn't always go pretty. So they definitely need to work on yeah. some other options on the half court. But when they get in transition, they're they're definitely fine. They're fine in the West if they're if they're on fast breaks. That's for sure. <laughs> so um, uh, another game of the year, in my opinion, and I'm, I'm a little upset at myself because I was actually watching this game and I fell asleep. <laughs> In the in the sick in the second overtime. To but, be fair, it did go pretty late. Um, I, oh yeah, it's all West Coast time um, and double overtime. So you you know nobody in the East Coast was watching. I was say game. people in the East probably woke <laughs> up and thought their phone was glitching when they saw that score. Yeah. So man, you know, and so chance the crazy part about that game was as, as I was watching it was that man, you can sit here and talk about yeah, okay. Nobody was playing defense or whatever because you uh you give up. What was the final score on it? One it was one seventy six, one seventy five was the final. Yep. Oh, and man. it wasn't even uh, like it was uh, just the overtimes. Like when you look at the overtimes, mm-hmm. they only scored like ten points per overtime. It was truly just a crazy regular like regulation type game too. So it wasn't just the overtimes where they started pouring on 20 points each. Like this was just a crazy high scoring back and forth game throughout. And if every, Mm -hmm. every Russell Westbrook Clippers game is going to be like that, then we're in for a fun ride. (laughs) Well, you know, the cool part about this game was that like, like, yeah, it was high scoring, but when you, if the eye test, if you watched that game, the defense was not actually 
bad. Like mm-hmm. I've seen a lot worse defense oh, yeah. played this season than than both of those teams played. Everybody was just it was one of those nights, a magical night in basketball where everybody was just getting buckets. Yeah. You know, where where like it was just, you know, it's just one of those Saturday mornings at the Y yep. where you you You're go pull it. up and it's just one of it's one of those days where you feeling it, your homeboy feeling it, uh, and uh, and then the dudes that you playing against, all them feeling it. It was just one of those days where like everybody was getting buckets, and uh, and uh, it was a really a uh, uh, fun game to watch. Um, but chance, uh, uh, I don't want to talk about this game too much. But did you happen to see the comments post game about Westbrook <laughs> with uh, De'Aaron Fox and Malik? Yeah. I saw that one. Yeah. So for those that didn't see it, basically Darren Fox and Malik Monk were together at the podium for post game. And the reporter starts asking him about Russell Westbrook and his fit with the Clippers, which media can be so strange sometimes. Like, why would you just ask the opposing team like about that? And Darren Fox, yeah. because this is a PG 13 rated podcast, I'll say he didn't give an F about them over there that they're only worried about them. And I, I liked it because it had some Grizz vibes to me. Like they kind of sounded like a, a yeah. Grizz team, like what Jai or Bain would have said if they asked that same question. And Malik was like, oh yeah, we ain't worried about them. Like we're, we're here now too. And so that kind of leads me to my next question. Are the Kings legit? I mean, that was a big win for them. They're pretty firm at the three seed in the West. Can this team make a run? Do you think? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, the, the, the Kings are legit, man. Um, I, I can tell you, cause I've, uh, I've actually been watching a lot of Kings games over the past couple of weeks, um, just because they've been piquing my interest. I'm like, is this Fugazi or is this real? No, this Kings team is real. They're they fun to watch, got a too. lot of depth on that team as well. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, super fun to watch. Uh, Mike Brown is my candidate at this point for Coach of the Year. He's got to be up um, there. Just because you, you take this team from being irrelevant and then you come in in your first year and you turn them into – a like a legit playoff contender. Man, Only two team, games back of the, the two playoff seed right contender. now. Like they have a legit yeah, chance. To depending be the two on seed. the depending on how their matchup is, obviously, like in the West, like we are so far away from making predictions about the Western Conference mm-hmm. right now, just because uh, everything's going to come down to matchups in the West, mm-hmm. uh, just just by how close it is, dude. This team is not far. Uh, it's not crazy to say that the Kings can make it to the Western Conference Finals or even the actual NBA Finals this year, depending on matchups. Now, obviously, the Finals is a bit of a stretch for this team, in my opinion. But, man, if you sit there and you look at how this team plays, dude, they are tough to stop. When that's a bonus and De'Aaron Fox pick and roll, man, having having your, your role guy – being be so good with with handling the rock, man, it mm-hmm. is so different. Like Sabonis has completely opened up the Sacramento Kings offense. Oh yeah, and then De'Aaron Fox is having, in my opinion, just with with everything involved, probably his best year playing basketball. Oh no question, uh, man. Like man, you bring in Herder, uh, uh, and and the role that he's playing for this team, man, dude. The, I'm I'm big on the Kings. I actually think that the Kings can make a run this year. Um, a lot of it just just is it's gonna come down to matchups. Like who are they playing? Um, but uh, but you know, and you said look at the Western Conference. Like I can see the Kings knocking out anybody in the West just as long as uh as long as the right stuff happens. Yeah, so, I think for me, the their Kings ceiling. I I do think they can make a conference finals with the right matchups, and if they get hot, I don't think they yeah. can win three straight series against the West just yet. If you look at their matchups, they'd have to face like a a Mavericks, a Grizzlies, maybe Clippers, Warriors. Like I don't see them winning three straight against that level of competition. But to your point, I do think mm-hmm. with the right matchups, they could definitely make a conference finals, which would be a huge success for their team, especially when you look at their expectations going into the season. And yeah, I mean, the way they're playing Sabonis is just the perfect fit. He's unlocking so many other guys. He's kind of like a mini Jokic out there at this point. And yeah, they're a ton of fun to watch. I could definitely see them making a run. And this is long-term success. Like this isn't going to be their last year being relevant. They're all young and they've got a play style that is going to lead to long-term success too. So I I don't think this team is going anywhere. Yeah. Shout out to Mike Brown, man. You, uh, you deserve all the kudos, man, because cause you cause them boys are playing. Uh, Chance, so you text me about this game, and I was actually not watching it, and I'm super upset <laughs> I missed it. But what the bleep <laughs> happened in Philadelphia? 
Philadelphia <laughs> last night. Bro, the Sixers, <laughs> they have just had some crazy games. You talk about the Grizzlies game first coming up Thursday night, and then this game against Boston last night was just absolutely insane too. So we've got it starting out with – my whole timeline is just talking down on Jason Tatum because he was just out there struggling, particularly in the first three quarters. He he just looked off mm-hmm. out there. Like every jump shot he took, he was off balance. He just did not really look right. And it just seemed like another one of those nationally televised games that Jason Tatum just didn't bring his A game. And he was he was taking a lot of heat yeah. on NBA Twitter throughout the night last night. And you've got Joel Embiid just out there dominating, Harden looking like Harden. And the Sixers look great. And then all of a sudden in the fourth quarter, things just switched. And... The last 30 seconds were just absolutely insane. So just to run through what happened. So basically, the Sixers tie it up. Embiid hits a huge turnaround shot. Philadelphia is going crazy. It's just complete mayhem in there. And the Celtics end up getting the ball with about 10 seconds left. And they just drew up an incredible play. When you talk about Mike Brown being a coach of the year, I think Missoula is definitely up there as well. And this play that he drew up, basically, he gives it to Smart at half or a little past half court. Tatum back cuts. He hits it in stride. And Tatum just takes a couple of dribbles, step back, and pulls up from three and just absolutely drills it with a second and a half remaining. So then they inbound the ball to Embiid, who takes a shot from basically the free throw line of the other side of the court and just absolutely drills it. But it was just a little too late. Would have tied the game, but it was after the buzzer. Embiid even knew it was after the buzzer. He just went straight back to the locker room, didn't even wait around for the final check. But it was just absolute mm-hmm. chaos to end that game. And I tell you, like I think all these teams – have just come back like well rested because these games that we're seeing over the past couple of days is just incredible. I think every team needed that all-star break when you've got guys like Embiid and Harden who have carried such a high workload, the way that they're playing right now, the Celtics mm-hmm. just dominating as well. Like it's just been some entertaining games. And last night was just absolutely insane. As soon as I saw that, I had to text you like, please, please tell me you're watching this because that those last 15 seconds were just absolutely crazy. Man, you know, and I, I wonder if like, you know, these guys coming back from the break, I think, like the sense of urgency is is yep. there. Like uh, the All Star, the All Star weekend was moved back a, a, a couple weeks later than what it normally is. Like normally, teams had it was like a roughly around thirty ish games left on the on the end of the season. It was more of a like a third mm-hmm. of the season. But now this year, all teams are like around twenty ish mm-hmm. games left. So it's a lot less of a runway yep. um, uh, for teams heading into the playoffs. And I think. Man, it shows you that these guys are true professionals, and they're like, "Hey, no, we got to turn it on now because um, if we don't start winning these games, then then uh, you know who knows what's going to happen." Right. Um, you, you see, you see that sense of urgency all over the place, um, and then like you even see that. Um, I'm excited for today. Um, uh, you know, by the time this pod comes out, this game will, will already be over, and uh, maybe I'm wrong, and maybe it's a a, a, a dead game, but. This game at two thirty with the Mavs and the Lakers. You got both teams that made made big time yep. trades, um, and they're both trying to figure it out. Um, the Mavs look good against uh, San Antonio, of course, like everybody else looks good against. Yeah, they've San lost Antonio. what sixteen um, at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everybody looks good. Everybody looks great, but their offense looks great. Their defense still has uh, major concerns on on the defensive end for the Mavs. So. Uh, but then the, the Lakers, similar situation, made a big trade. But then uh, AD and LeBron, what they played, like maybe like 26 minutes or something like that yep. the other night. Um, Malik Beasley went off for 25 points. At no point in the season have LeBron and AD been able to to not play crazy minutes and put up crazy stats right. and still win games. Yeah, so so uh, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm interested in seeing that. Uh, were there any other games, Chance, that piqued your interest from the past week? Um, I think those are the main ones. Regarding today's game, my one prediction with the Mavs-Lakers game that I guarantee happens, mm-hmm. after the game, LeBron and Kyrie are going to chat around half court, and they're going to cover their mouth like this, and they're going to have a discussion, and it's going to be a huge thing, like, oh, LeBron's recruiting Kyrie to L.A. next year. I would bet everything I own that that happens after this game today. Oh, let me tell you, ESPN is going to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, man, I think it's been a it's been a great weekend of games. It's good to see teams, you know, locked in. I think that's a great point. You know, there's 20 games left. It's time. And I think you might even see that with coaching decisions, too, when you've noticed that guys that typically were resting back to backs or, you know, guys that are limiting their minutes. I think a lot of that is just waiting till after the All-Star break. And now you're going to see particularly like that's a big thing in the in the mm-hmm. Memphis community, too. like John Jaron. They play like 
29 or 30 minutes a game. I think guys are going to start ramping their minutes up to around 35, 36 minutes a night. Like it's time, you know, especially in the West, every team is separated by a marginal amount of games. It's time to put the, the foot on the gas, play your guys, lock, locking up your rotations. And it's going to be some exciting basketball in the next couple of weeks. And I'm excited to see it for sure. I'm pumped. Now, Chance, we just started playing basketball, so we don't really have any players of the week um uh, uh for 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 you guys out there but chance let's uh who do you got on the who's hot list right now in the NBA? yeah so we've got some teams that are building up some winning streaks starting with the milwaukee bucks they were a little up and down throughout the season they started off just red hot um obviously middleton's been out of the lineup but now that you know they're back in full stretch and they've won 13 games in a row now Giannis is still putting up an MVP like season, although he's a little less efficient this season than he has been in the past. He looks absolutely incredible. And for a minute, it looked like Boston might just be running away with the East and they're going to you know, be the representatives. But the Bucks have always just been floating around and now they're just red hot. They've won 13 in a row. They're only one game back from the top seed as of now. So they are red hot right now. And it's going to set up a really good battle for home court in the East with them in Boston. And I think that's going to be a big deal, particularly the way that we've seen teams just play so much better at home this season. I think getting that one seed is going to be incredibly important. So excited to see how that goes. Um, any thoughts on how the Bucks well, have looked? Well, and you know, well, yeah, you know, uh, my biggest thing is that um, the Bucks have have uh, have looked uh, have, have looked good all season long. But the biggest news for the Bucks is that Giannis avoided a serious mm-hmm. injury um, to his uh, to his wrist, man, because. Uh, Going a going a long uh, stretch without your MVP yep. into the into the playoffs, that would have been tough. So um, so yeah so so yeah they haven't they haven't given an exact <laughs> timeline, but it sounds like it's more short term than long term. Didn't stop him from getting a bucket in the All Star game, mm-hmm. but had to go out there and, and do what he could do over there. But yeah, I mm-hmm. think as long as he's able to come back within the next you know week or two, keep going, they're going to be a contender out east. Sticking in the east. The New York Knicks are having some fun. Did you see with Brunson and Randall doing the the off-the-backboard alley-oop to seal their five-game winning streak? The Knicks actually look pretty legit. And speaking of teams that are up and down, I mean, I remember a stretch with the Knicks where it just seemed like they were blowing 20-point leads back-to-back like every single game. And they've had some struggles, but they're really solidifying their team too. And still don't think they're obviously good enough to beat like a Boston or Milwaukee. But this is a team that could win a playoff series, maybe two depending on the matchups. And... They're really gelling together, too. Five in a row as of now, and they look really hot. Um, any other thoughts on how the Knicks have looked lately? No. Uh, I think the addition of Josh Hart is a uh, perfect addition for this Knicks team. You go out and you get a guy that that's familiar with uh, that with the people in that organization. Um, he's fit seamlessly in there. I mean, he's already – um, uh, asking for an extension mm-hmm. with the Knicks because uh, he said, I think this is a perfect place on and off the court. Of course, it's it's New York, right? Um, and then you're there with, with your old teammate and you're there with people you're familiar with. Um, I really think that that's a great yep. pickup for them. I mean, this Knicks team, I think now is – I think they're at a point now where it's safe to say like, like, like they're just one guy away from actually being oh, yeah. a problem. Um, and which that's which uh, you tell a lot of Knicks fans that man they you probably probably never thought you would say that in this yep. decade they, oh you're just one big piece away from making it happen all those years chasing free agents they were like man we just got to go get something we got we got to go mm-hmm. get something because we don't have anything right but man now uh next big free agent that comes out there um or or uh, or a guy that asked for a trade they got all those picks mm-hmm. man. The Knicks uh, next year could be a completely different team. That's that's uh, that's way more lethal than what they are now. But they a uh, lot like the Kings, man. They have done everything they need to do. They're on yep. the right path. Um, we'll see if if uh, the Tibbs effect kicks in yep. next year with uh, with with uh, with with burnout. But overall, man, I I have nothing negative to oh, say. Yeah, I mean, to your point, like they always want to be that free agent destination, but they haven't been for the last really decade plus just because they're like, who's going to want to play for the Knicks? Like they've just been a dumpster fire. But now they've built Mm -hmm. that core up to where like, okay, this team is one piece away. Now, if you are a superstar hitting the market, that's not a team you immediately scratch off your list. And, you know, who doesn't want to go play in New York anyways, as long as they have a good foundation, which they have now. So they could be a problem for the next few years as well. 
And last team, sticking in the Eastern Conference, we talked about them a little bit on the deadline pod, the Toronto Raptors, who surprised a lot of people. They went and bought Jakob Pertl. They didn't trade OG. They didn't trade Siakam. They didn't trade Van Fleet. They didn't trade Gary Trent. They decided, you know what? We're going to stay still, and we're going to make our run in the play-in. And since then, they've won four games in a row. So they actually look better. Their ceiling is still limited, but I always thought this was a team that had the talent. I mean, we've seen them make the playoffs before and give teams a run for their money. They have a lot of talent on their team. Mm -hmm. So is this a team that could possibly surprise some people down the stretch? What do you think? I mean, you think about it. They've got vets on their roster, so yeah. I mean, you said you talk talking about the playoffs is a total different, uh, total different ball game. Go yep. win four. You know what I mean? Like you go if if the Raptors end up playing against a team like the New York Knicks, for example, man, I I wouldn't be surprised if uh, the Raptors uh win that series. I mean, I might even pick the Raptors just because right. of experience. Uh, boding well for them. You know, this will be the first time that this core team of the Knicks. Is in the playoff series. Jalen Brunson is a big time playoff guy. Um, uh, I mean, you know, so you've got that on your side for the Knicks. But you think about the Raptors; they've got experience. Mm-hmm. They've been there. Uh, yeah, I mean, the the Raptors are in a in a good in a good place now. Do I expect the Raptors to make a run? In the right. East? No. So the I don't. <clears throat> the but, problem is they're four but, and a half but, games back. I think they'll, yeah, they're be four a and a half out. games back from the six seed. You really, mm-hmm. if you're in the East, you've got to do everything you can to avoid the play in because you've got Boston, Milwaukee, one, two. If you make the play in, like you're going to face one of those two teams, and that's going to be really hard. Even the way Philly's looked at the three spot, but mm-hmm. we've seen Toronto, you know, give Philly a run for their money just in the playoffs last year as well. So I think if they could get up to that six seed, I could see them potentially ups- upsetting the Sixers, especially because you never know how health goes down in the playoffs, especially with a team like Philly. But I don't know. That's a lot of ground to make up to, for them to get up there. So I think best case for them, they make the playoffs and maybe they take the Bucks or the Celtics into a deep playoff series. But they've at least shown that like they have the potential. They're putting things together now. Jakob Pertl has looked amazing. He's putting up some huge numbers, and he is exactly what they needed. They just had no interior mm-hmm. presence next to Siakam down low, and he's given them everything they need from that aspect where they're actually finally able to do some things in the half court, whereas before it was similar to the Grizzlies. They could only really score playing up and down transition ball. So could definitely keep an eye on them because I think the next yeah. couple of weeks for them will determine how they approach the off season. If they decide, okay, we're going to still sell out in the summer, or they might say, you know what? We do have a a foundation here. Let's try to add that one extra piece and be contenders on the short term. Well, and, and another thing, chance, uh, another Eastern conference team. I do want to, to get in here before we get on out of here. The Chicago bulls, uh, man, Lonzo officially ruled out. Um, for the season, the Bulls, they brought – man, I'm having a brain fart. They just brought in somebody. Who they bring in? I didn't even see who they brought in, to be honest. I have not kept up they with just, the Bulls at all. <laughs> I just kind of write them off at this point. Yeah. They they, they brought in a, they brought in the free agents. Let me pull them up. Yeah, the Lonzo thing, while you're pulling that up, it's disappointing. It's definitely not surprising. I think ever since the beginning of the season when we heard the rumors that they that he really couldn't even walk or put pressure on his knee, like he can't run still – I'm just hoping at this point he's able to get back on the court at some point. And it's not a Brandon Roy situation because we look at the Bulls, how they play. Beverly, yeah, yeah that's right. So he'll he'll be a good veteran presence for them. Um, try to change the culture a little bit. But yeah, I, I really just hope that he's, you know, Lonzo is able to recover over the summer and at least come back because remember last season, they were like a top three seed in the East for so long and they had a lot of talent. It's just staying yeah. healthy and putting it all together. So definitely curious to see how they approach the off season, but really, you know, fingers crossed that Lonzo is able to make a full recovery well, at this point. And, and man, they are just such a different team with him because Lonzo ball is one of the best perimeter mm-hmm. defenders in the league. Like he is elite. Like you sit here, like I think about like drew holiday and then, Probably Lonzo Ball. I mean, it's probably some other guys mm-hmm. up there I'm not thinking about, but uh, right now at this moment. But Lonzo Ball's uh, perimeter defense is that elite, um, and then you you couple that with his playmaking for those two wings and DeRozan and Levine, and he was really what kind of mm-hmm. stirred that pot. And man, you and then you really sit and think about how Lonzo's career started in L.A. and then everything that he went through uh, and then get got traded for Anthony Davis and then uh, kind of you know revived his career in the in a few years at yep. uh, in New Orleans and then got to Chicago and really took off man it's so it's kind of it's sad to see man that happened 
to Alonzo uh, and everything you hear about Lonzo is that, that he's a mm-hmm. great guy um, off the court. And, you know, it's just, it's just one of those odd situations that, that he's had a million doctors look at and they just, yeah. they can't figure out what, what the issue is. And uh, you, you can't help but feel bad for the guy. Um, but, you know, I guess signing Patrick Beverly is a, is a, is a good uh, putting lipstick on a pig mm-hmm. situation. Um, but, uh, but at the end of the day, Patrick Beverly is far from, from, uh, uh, yeah. Lonzo ball. Yeah. I think that's so, a culture shift move. Just trying to, you know, yeah. get guys in the, in the right environment in the locker room. But yeah, definitely just wishing for a speedy recovery, hoping to get back next year because he's a lot of fun to watch. He was able to rework his jump shot and become a, a true three and D type of specialist from that guard position. And I think he's, he's a big time player for them. So definitely hoping he can make a full recovery and come back next year for sure. Cool. Well, guys, thank you guys once again for tuning in to the Hoop Junkie Podcast, the number one sports podcast in the world. We really appreciate you guys. Make sure you like, subscribe, share, comment on all of our videos and uh, and and any and listen to us and stream us on anywhere you get your podcast because that's important. All right, guys, until next time, we'll holla at you. Peace. <laughs>